Welcome to Norse Code, the number one podcast for your Minnesota Vikings. I am your host and producer. My name is James Bogoshnik. Thank you guys so much for listening. And at the other end of the tin can and string, we can find our analyst and co-host. You know him from numerous blogs and podcasts around the internet, most notably from theathletic.com. He is Mr. Useful Human, Arif Hassan. Arif, how are you doing tonight? Doing all right, I guess. I'm not thinking about the Vikings too much, so actually probably better than a lot of people. How are you? I, You know what? Same. I had pitched that we needed to uh, to interview a former Vikings player earlier this week and then just completely ignore the fact that he was ever on the Vikings and just ask him about the Super Bowl <laughs> run that he had made and <laughs> just go for like half hour 45 just all about, you know, you know, this was the quarterback that you played for. What what kind of things did you run into in, in terms of like protection? Like what were like what tricks you did? Anything to not talk about the Vikings? <laughs> Be like, right, oh. yeah, because we care and respect about our listeners. Yeah, we thought yeah. that actually isn't true, and we're going to be talking about the Vikings. We uh, for a moment, I thought that you know, after seven plus years or whatever, maybe you guys are tired of listening to to us talk about the Vikings, so we could you know talk about the Ravens for a little bit and see how that went. Uh, but not not new Ravens, classic Ravens, and uh, ask and finally answer the question of whether or not Joe Flacco is elite. But uh, not uh, not going to do that this week. Instead, however, we will be we will be discussing the loss to the Falcons and all that is coming out of that, <laughs> because this was not a this was not a pretty game. By the fallout, yeah, yeah. The, 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 the the fallout of this is going to take a bit to uh, to finish up here. This was not. If you wanted to look at the potential end of the Vikings season, you probably could start here. Uh, so we have the Vikings uh, Falcons game to recap. And if you'd like to go over to the mailbag and find and, and hear our discussion on Zimmer and Spielman, because I know a number of you would rather not listen to anything involving that game, head over to the top of the mailbag. Uh, check the show notes over at the Daily Norseman to see what timestamp that's going to be, because we're going to have all sorts of things to talk about right there. So go ahead and, uh, and head down there if that's what uh, if that's what you're into. But before we go too much further into the show, just want to thank you guys so much for listening. Want to thank you guys for spreading the word about Norse code, whether it be through social media, just telling a friend, uh, or giving uh, giving money to uh, to Norse code over at patreon.com slash norse code or to paypal.me slash norse code as well uh we do have a new patreon uh member to mention real quick just want to thank you to uh to maria beekman thank you so much for donating to the show you can access su- things such as the bonus episodes that we post over at uh patreon by giving three dollars and fifty cents a month or tree fitty to help to keep the Loch Ness monster at bay and you know, I've been thinking about it, and I have this giant pile of swag for Norse code. And you know, we I was sell, I was sending stuff out last year, and and that was fun. And I was kind of doing like a random lottery uh, through uh, through the show. And what I was getting was uh, like a bunch of people saying, "No, it's fine. I don't I don't want anything sent to me." So, if you are somebody who subscribes via Patreon and would like to receive some form of Norse code swag. And some of it is more interesting than others, but usually it's just a little thing here and there. Uh, If you would like to receive Norse code swag, you can receive that by first donating to Norse code at patreon.com slash Norse code, and then uh, just sending a message through there saying that you would like to sign up for it or send a message through Twitter or through email. Uh, Twitter is obviously Norse code DN. Uh, the email address is norsecodepodcast at gmail.com. I will then confirm whether or not you are a person who is signed up through the uh, uh, through Patreon, and I will send it out. And we'll have this, uh, I'll send this out very beginning of December. So I'm going to give this until December. So if you sign up for it right now, you just need to be active until December, and I will send something out to you. So if you are interested, and we do have one large object that is also ready to be sent out. A very Norse code esque phenomenal object. Yeah, a Norse code classic. Uh, if you are on Twitter, I may ask that you send a picture uh, <laughs> of this when you receive it because it truly is a work of art. Uh, I believe it's even framed. So, uh, but if you are interested in such thing, if you would like uh, swag from Norse code this year, 
please go to patreon.com slash Norse code, sign up there, and then just quick send me a message uh, either first when you sign up or if you are currently a subscriber, uh, just sending a message through there or through Twitter or through email, just letting me know that you would you would like to get some swag this year from us. And I'll send some show notes and I will send a, a lovely piece of swag that we have sitting here over at the office. So again, if you, I'm just trying to cheer people up because the season has been crap. So I feel like what we all need is some... F- I say free stuff, some semi-free stuff. So if you're interested, you know, again, patreon.com slash Norse code, and I will this, find this, a way. Uh, this big piece of swag is one of the only times we have gone out of our way to actually acquire said swag in order to distribute it. Yes. So. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this, is pretty, this is pretty special. And, uh, and and we enjoy it thoroughly and really does encapsulate both everything that's great about the show, everything that people complain about the show, <laughs> and everything yeah. that uh, that is both right and wrong about the Minnesota Vikings. So I, I realize I'm, I'm hyping this thing up, but I promise it's totally worth it. But again, if you are interested in such a thing, patreon.com slash Norse code, and we can, uh, we can go from there. So again, thank you, Maria, so much for signing up. Let's uh, let's go to the review of the Falcons game, and Mike Zimmer said it in the in the post game, and it needs to be brought up right now. The thing that's that's important for for the Vikings is that the onside kick game seriously needs improvement. If the Vikings want any chance at playing in the postseason, Dan Absolutely Bailey, disappointing. yeah, yeah, this is this that was crap. Uh, stuck out like a sore thumb for sure. I was definitely paying attention to the onside kick when it happened. Um, for sure. And I didn't like look down and realize that the Falcons had the ball at the 40 or anything like that. I certainly watched it and was disgusted. So much so that you're only referencing one instead of both of them. Yeah. Did that, was there two? There were two and they were both terrible. Wow. Okay, cool. Well, um, James, the analyst here. to To be fair to Zimmer, um, not to me, I should be watching to be fair to Zimmer. (laughs) <laughs> um, he was listing a bunch of things at once and ended with, yeah, the special teams, they like, they sucked too. I mean, there's the long return and the, and the onside kicks were trash and, you know, and, and he added that at the end of his, like, we were bad and I don't know why speech at the beginning of his presser. And then yeah, he got the, that part got tweeted out. So it made it seem like he was like isolating that or leading with that when that really wasn't happening. But it is funny to act like that's the case, right? To just be like, oh, yeah, Zimmer totally just put it on Dan Bailey for those awful onside kicks. And I, not want, for like- I want that to be the thing. I want him to go right back to the presser and be like, Dan Bailey seriously is the reason for this loss. Now, if you look at this statistically, like, <laughs> we, are, we would be doing onside kicks against a team that a couple weeks ago didn't know how they worked. So <laughs> if you look at that, and, and 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 figure that's that's their biggest weakness. If we have a kicker who can't do that, we need to find a new kick. And just twenty minutes on Dan Bailey and the kicks, and then just walk off without having anything to say about you know Matt Ryan and Julio Jones' big day or anything, or you know the 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 defend the the you know trying to defend the terrible decisions of Kirk Cousins or anything. No, just nail Dan Bailey to the cross for like 10, 20 minutes. I yeah. That would be pretty amazing. I'm I'm pretty anti kicker though, so I'm I, I'm I'm kind of on record. So I suppose that would be very on brand for me. Maybe even just a bit too much. Okay, fine. Uh, boy, where do you even start? Actually, I know exactly where to start. The opening play for Kirk Cousins <laughs> seems like a fantastic place to start. It was an interception, the first of three that he would have in the first half. This kind of set a tone for the day that Cousins was going to have. Yeah, and uh, so, you know, when it happened, it was like, I was like, oh, of course, this is the day that, you know, the Vikings are going to have. Great, fine. And I wasn't like, I, I, I've stopped getting like mad at the Vikings uh, for the like on-field play. Like, obviously, I rant a lot in this podcast. So I can't say I just don't get mad anymore. But I don't like feel like a ton of like, I can't believe you did this in terms of like the level of play that you put together. Right. Like normally I just get mad about stuff. That's like very easy, actionable. Like I can't believe you signed this guy. I can't believe you drafted this, that sort of stuff. I don't usually get mad at the Vikings, but, uh, and I wasn't then, but then I read 
Chad's story in The Athletic. Um, this is not a plug, but of course it is. So head over to The Athletic um, and sign up and, and give us money and help me stay employed. Um, but uh, I was I was I was listening to the Zoom presser as well. But the way Chad kind of put it was just kind of nuts. And I actually got mad at Cousins, which, you know, it's tough for me to get mad at players for playing poorly because like obviously they want to play better too right but um the way the way chad put it you know in the article he goes you know mike zimmer rubbed his forehead stuck as he tried to forget how his vikings went step for step on the road with one of the nfl's best teams last week then got routed at home by one of the worst teams seven days later he called it strange he wore the same grizzled look but the intensity was gone he's usually defiant after losses ready to explain away what went wrong often in blunt fashion but on this sunday he was perplexed how could this team be so bad? How could they go from a playoff victory last season to a campaign in ruins before Halloween? How can they occasionally look like they've turned the corner and then revert to one that's not even competitive? And I'm thinking about that. And then I'm thinking about how Zimmer talked about how he had, he thought that the Vikings had actually a really remarkable week of practice, that they were on the verge potentially of a breakout after going toe-to-toe with the Seahawks. You know, Russell Wilson had his least efficient day as a passer so far. Um, this year and on the very first play Kirk Cousins throws an interception and the Vikings trailed like since that like I guess they, the Falcons had to score first right so after three minutes the Vikings were never in control of the game and it's just like dude it all fell off and it's not Cousins' fault solely like it's obviously Cousins' fault he threw the pick and Cousins played poorly and that's bad obviously but like all the Vikings played poorly, right? Like, except I guess for Justin Jefferson, we can talk about that in a second. But like, so many Vikings were at fault for the loss. But I'm just like, Kirk, you goddamn idiot! I can't believe you ruined it for everybody. <laughs> Which is not what happened, but it just feels like that, right? Like, it feels like you do all this practice, you you, you build it up, you've got you know th- this kind of momentum going, sort of. I mean, you're coming off of a loss. Um, but you've got like some validation that you've got the ability to kind of compete with some of these best teams. You had one point against the Titans. You had one point against the Seahawks. You stomped the Texans, as what good teams do. Uh, it turns out the Colts are actually a lot better than we thought, so losing to them, not as embarrassing. Uh, it turns out the Packers are a lot better than we thought, losing to them, maybe not as embarrassing, although fairly embarrassing fashion. So you're losing to good teams, you're beating bad teams, uh, and you're getting better against those good teams. You have a great week of practice. You've got a good game plan set in stone. And on the very first play, it just goes in sideways like good god is that, i actually like hours later like i clicked on chad's story to read it hours later i get mad at kirk cousins at the moment i'm just like ah, of course but <laughs> watching the game like, i think i had tweeted i think i tweeted something right. about this goddamn team like right. <laughs> um but yeah it's just like uh, come on man people's jobs are on the line and you do that and, and Kirk is right too. Like after the game, you know, uh, we're just like, "Hey, what happened on the?" Which, by the way, uh, small story about being in the press box. It's kind of embarrassing for me. Um, so now we're all doing on the, these all on Zoom, right? Which means there's actually not a reason to be at the game except now I don't have to watch a delayed feed. And uh, Kirk goes, uh, he gives like his opening statement about how he needs to do better, how it's his responsibility, et cetera, et cetera. How he played poorly and that's on him. And uh, there's a pause, so there's an opening for a question, and I unmute, and I ask the question. And everybody looks at me, like in the press box, they turn and look at me because it doesn't go through, and they're like, Arif, you're muted. And it turns out I'm not muted. My mic is broken, and I just feel like an idiot because I was just like, hey, Kirk, what happened on those picks? Which is kind of a blunt way to put it, um, but I just kind of wanted to know. I didn't really think about it, framing the question. And so nothing happens. Kirk's like, why isn't anyone asking me any questions? And then <laughs> Gessling asks a better version of the questions. Like Ben Gessling's like, hey, Kirk, can you walk us through what happened all those interceptions? <laughs> but yeah, it was just like, God damn. And, and now I need to figure out what to do about my mic situation. If that's just going to keep happening. But um, which, I mean, you know, your, here at home. Your like, question was intercepted. My, oh, wow. Yeah, there you go. Ouch. In the, in the spirit of things. Um, but yeah, Kirk was like, yeah, that was like a year one rookie mistake that I made. Uh, so can't do that. Um, never thought I'd do that. That was pretty bad. Like, it was just like, like, he was like, you know, 
going at himself for he's right it's a rookie mistake it's bad uh the vikings have so this is the thing that gets me is that the vikings have for the last two weeks i didn't actually review the coverages in the falcons game all that closely but uh prior to that they've been playing a ton of cover two um the the first touchdown of the game was cover two they've been playing a ton of cover two in tampa two right where they've got two high safeties i wrote an article about this uh and um sometimes that you've got a lurking linebacker as a result so that's what they've been doing defensively and the very first thing that gets kirk is a floating underneath linebacker in cover two and it's just like dude that's all the vikings have been doing how have you how did you not see the linebacker man that's ridiculous and he didn't try to slot it over the linebacker really he just threw it as if that linebacker wasn't there, which is like a Jameis Winston level mistake. Like it was just brutal. So that was the first play of the game. And you're right. It kind of set the tone. Uh, it didn't have to, right? Like the Vikings have a great red zone defense in theory, right? You know, we, we all know how tenuous that might be. Um, but, you know, they, they force it to a field goal uh, and, you know, the Vikings get the ball back and they drive down for a touchdown. Suddenly they have the lead. It doesn't have to be that way. Right. Uh, but, of course, this is the game that the Vikings were most favored in probably all year, and uh, they lose kind of like 2018 against the Bills. Um, I should have seen this. I should have picked the Falcons to win in the athletic pick them, but uh, guess not. So me and John Krasinski are still tied. I like how the, during the 2018 season with the game against the Bills, I was so just absolutely infuriated by that by what was going on in the game, I had to leave the house and I like walked. I, I almost walked without shoes on down to the bar a couple of blocks away and just went in there. So I wasn't cursing loudly in front of a bunch of kids. Like I remember <laughs> vividly how much I didn't want to be around anyone else. And I ended up walking down the street to the bar, sitting down to the bar, having a couple of beers with a, uh, with, with a, uh, Packers fan who was sitting next to me as we watched Adrian Peterson destroy the Packers <laughs> as, with the Redskins. <laughs> and the only solace I got that day was from that, was watching Adrian Peterson score two touchdowns or whatever, 100 plus yards, and the, the guy just being like, how is he still in the, how is he still good? What is he? He's like, Listen, you, you're not going to be – he's going to end up signing with some NFC North team before he goes and retires, and you're going to have to deal with him twice a year again. It's like, <laughs> oops. Oh, turns out. Yeah, but that was like I – was, I was like actively like angry at how poorly the Vikings played against the Bills. This game, I just sat in my chair and just went, all right, well, this is kind of what I expected. Yeah, this is the shape of things to come. Um <laughs> Yeah, so it didn't have to be that way. The Vikings could have had a stop on the Falcons, uh, forced a field goal, uh, but instead they allow a touchdown. On their next drive, they go like nine yards uh, and punt. Um, or no, actually, fewer than that. And then the drive after that, um, the Falcons uh, get a 50-yard field goal. Vikings get the ball back. They go three and out again. Um just a, a whole mess of nothing. And if the tail of the Seahawks game was the dominance in the time of possession for Minnesota, this was the exact opposite. Yeah, like in in three drives in the first quarter, in three drives, they had a total of seven plays. That's for 10 yards. Like, like <laughs> come on, dude. I can't, put, like, and then, and then, they get the ball off of a fumble, which great, you know, fine. You're forced to fumble, um, drive 74 yards. Uh, they get to the Atlanta one and, and they can't like they've, they've four shots, right? Cause they're at, cause I think it's first and goal at the one or something like that. Or first and goal at the two and they just can't get the ball in. And it's like, oh, they were just trying for a greatest hits of what happened in Seattle. Yeah. And, and the thing is, I don't hate the call. I don't hate going for it on fourth down. Um, you know, they forced a punt on the subsequent drive in part because, you know, the Falcons were so backed up. They had to convert so many first downs. They didn't get the ability to do that. The Vikings get the ball back. That's part of the reason that you go forward and fourth down. I get it, right? Um, now obviously, the plan is not then to throw an interception on your next two drives. That kind of screws up the the math there. Um, but it just it just felt like nothing could possibly go their way. Like, 
okay, you you get the ball off the kickoff. Um, uh, no, actually, it's the Falcons get the ball off the kickoff at the half because the Vikings have the first possession, technically. Um, and they they even scored off of that. But you get the ball after that, you score a touchdown, and it's like, yeah, for what? Like at that, you're just like, who cares? Yeah, we hit garbage time right around the beginning of the third quarter, <laughs> if not before that. It was it was particularly brutal. Let's let's go over a couple of uh, things here, including the the fact that the Falcons just had absolutely no fear uh, of the Vikings, whether it be on third down or fourth down with the run. Like this was a team that was able to convert on third down repeatedly, while Seattle was having trouble all game. Yeah, so I find um, so for yeah, so that first drive they go to Todd Gurley a lot. I think um, it was something like a girly run, a girly run, a girly pass, a girly run, um, an incompletion, and a girly run, and then Julio. Um, but yeah, they they relied a lot on Gurley, and I I wouldn't have expected that to do much. I mean, the Vikings have a decent run defense, um, and and Gurley is coming off of a really remarkable game that you know they nevertheless lost, and their head coach got fired. He's coming off a remarkable game, but it's like. You know, it's not that intimidating compared to the fact that they have three receivers who have each had 180 yard games so far this year, right? Like they all have the ability to go off. Now, Russell Gage is maybe a little bit less threatening than Calvin Ridley and uh, and Julio Jones, but you know he's got the ability to get 120 yards or whatever, right? So you know that was the concerning part. Plus, they've got two backup receivers to those that are fairly talented as well. And so you know it's Gurley that's beating you on the ground, and it's like you've got all three of your linebackers in you switched out Hardy Nickerson for Todd Davis. I know it's not the same as having Ben Gideon, but you know what they're going to do. And so, yeah, I mean, they had difficulty tackling, they had difficulty getting their fits, right. They had difficulty aligning. And, and the thing about that is it's, they didn't even get, that wasn't even the point of the game where they had rotated their defensive tackles. That was Jaleel Johnson and Shamar Stefan, your two, run stuffers that don't have the ability to create pressure that should know the gaps that should know the fits. It's not like Eric Wilson was out of his gap. It's not like Eric Hendricks was, was, you know, misaligning. Everybody was in their gaps. They know their fits. And then Eric Wilson just gets blown up because he's a safety, right? Playing linebacker. And there's not much you can do about that. Shamar Stefan gets blown off the ball. There's not much like, it's just like, okay, great. Todd Gurley is, is, is running for a hundred, I guess. Uh, it, I mean, yeah, the Vikings had a ton of trouble, um, and Toggerly ends up running for 47, by the way, but, uh, that first drive was pretty brutal. Um, but, uh, the Vikings just had so much trouble early on stopping the run. And by the time they figured that out, the Falcons realized they had a former MVP throwing the ball and they just started throwing it around. And so, yeah, they just, they kind of stepped on the throats of the Vikings. They got a lead. They never let go. Um, Running the ball was obviously a huge asset to them early on. It didn't become an asset. Later on, the Vikings kind of figured it out. Um, but in the process of figuring it out, uh, ended up finding a way to give up a bunch more yards, but this time through the air. It was kind of odd sitting and watching Matt Ryan and being like, hey, do you remember when he played in a Super Bowl? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, right. you know, all of a sudden, he's the most accurate passer. He's got, uh, what? five or six 20 yard plays like he's just all over the place yeah he had six 20 yard plays four to julio right which at the beginning of the season you'd say yeah if they if they win a shootout that's probably how it happens but as the season has gone on it's been more ridley than julio getting those big plays and, and generating a ton of yardage um but yeah ridley ended up getting a number of receptions he never he didn't break um 70 yards in this game he got 61 but yeah, it was it was four four big plays to Julio, twenty plus yards, one twenty plus yard play to Hayden Hurst, which we'll talk about later, one twenty plus yard play to Russell Gage. So yeah, no, it was it was it was pretty reminiscent of the twenty sixteen Falcons from a production standpoint. It looked a lot different from like the way they designed their plays, what they called, you know, whether or not they were going to be doing a bunch of the Shanahan stuff. They weren't. It turns out uh, they just beat the Vikings by being like better than them, which uh, I guess is kind of the blueprint these days. Um, so yeah, a, a 40 to 23 loss against, you know, a team that just fired its coach. And this probably should be mentioned too. So it, it depends on when you go back and look at the statistics, but interim coaches off their first game, um, by some accounting, I think win 30% of their games, which is typically higher, uh, on that first game, 
which is typically higher than the win percentage of the teams are taking over because the only reason you're firing a coach midseason is if you haven't won very many games, right? And so that you're typically doing a little bit better than 30%. But I think, was it Luke Braun or, or Nick Olson or somebody tweeted at like since 2006, they've actually gone 13-13 or something like that. Um, so a 50% win rate for an interim coach, that's a pretty small sample, but that's a pretty huge bump because you don't fire coaches going 500 unless you're like in this Jeff Fisher situation or Marvin Lewis situation where it's like, all right, fine, we've had enough. Um, like, like, uh, was it uh, Sean Payton had three seasons of seven to nine and they're like, nah, he'll figure it out. And he did kind of, I mean, can't get past the playoffs now. He's like the new Marvin Lewis, but, um, yeah, that may have played a role. I don't know. The interim coach thing is, is just kind of weird. Um, there's something called the dead cat balance where it's just, you know, it's regression, right? A lot of these teams will lose close games like the Falcons. Um, lost against Dallas. I think they lost one other close game as well this year. So they were better than their record. We say that about a lot of bad teams, but they were probably better than their record. Um, and so just by circumstance, they're going to have a couple of wins that are not going to match the losses they had just because of the bounce of the ball. But that's not really what happened in this game. Like that might be true generally with interim coaches where you can be tricked by them because they start winning the close games that the previous coach lost and there's not really a sustainable way to continue winning close games. But the Falcons won with 40 points. That's not a dead cat bounce. Something probably happened. Um, so, uh, and maybe it's the Vikings were just bad, which, you know, from the perspective of somebody covering the Vikings, seems very possible. Um, maybe the Falcons figured out kind of all the pieces they need to work and they end up becoming a really good team and they end up going eight and eight this year, right? Which, I mean, because they're five losses, it's hard for them to go eight and eight. But if they do, you know, maybe they're a good team and the Vikings got punked. But, um, yeah, man, it's, it's way cooler to be the team that gets the coach fired than the team that gets a coach hired. Right. Like, whoa. Yeah. Rough. That, that un, unpleasant. So the Vikings go down and, and are still blanked until a surprising little drive from Minnesota and another surprising little drive. Like Minnesota has a little bit of momentum. And then there's that throw to Julio Jones with a defender on the ground and Julio stiff arming his way into the end zone that seemed like this was pretty much it. Yeah, somebody was like, hey, Arif, Julio over under before the game. They're like, Julio over under, um, was it 10 catches, 120 yards, two touchdowns? Um, and uh, I said, man, I don't know about the touchdowns, dude. Because uh, it's Julio, right? Like he doesn't score. I have been um, a long-suffering Julio Jones uh, fantasy person this year, and all, and I, I knew that starting him to that that Sunday was going to be a good idea. I didn't know it was going to be that good of an idea. Right? Yeah. In one of my leagues, I've got I've got Julio, and I actually um, two weeks ago I benched him for Russell Gage. I mean, I also have Stephon Diggs and Adam Thielen. It wasn't like you know I was bereft at receiver. But, like, I was like, you know, Russell Gage. And it turned out to be a good idea. Um, but this game, I was like, there's no way I'm not playing Julio. Are you kidding me? And, uh, yeah, it worked out. Um, but, uh, but yeah, uh, yeah, I was like, yeah, I don't know about the touchdowns, dude. Like, it's Julio. He's not going to score touchdowns. Uh, which I shouldn't have said anything um, because now it's my fault um, that Julio has two touchdowns. So, yeah, that second touchdown um, – was like, it's just like the Vikings forgot how to defend against scrambles. And of all the quarterbacks to forget how to defend scrambles, it's Matt Ryan. Like, I mean, he's not bad under pressure or anything like that, but it's Matt Ryan, dude. Like, he's not going to beat you to the edge. That's that's embarrassing that he was able to do that. And uh, I, I think... Um, he even had a it? chance to run that and backed up to before he made the throw. Like he, but that's he, why it looks so chaotic, right? Uh, like, yeah. So like, um, I, I'm I'm pulling up the play right now. I'm going to take a look at it from the end zone angle. But yeah, so um, the Falcons are in six man protection. Uh, Todd Gurley's into pass protect. He releases out into a route. And uh, was it uh, Fadi? It looks like gets pressure. No, it's Yannick uh, who gets pressure, forces uh, Ryan to duck out of the play. He's running, and and now at this point, I just paused it. It looks like he's trying to to gain yardage on this one, right? They're at their own forty. It's fourth and three. This sounds like a really bad idea. Like Matt Ryan is about to make a terrible decision. He's about to run into Eric Kendricks, 
And instead, he just starts backing up, like you said, starts taking these really wide, awkward steps as Eric Hendricks pulls up on him. And who is that defender? It must be Cameron Dancer, right? I believe no, that was Dantzler on the ground. No, it's, it's Gladney. Oh, it is Gladney. Um, oh, because Dantzler yeah. was Dantzler seemed actually to be somewhat useful uh, Sunday, but but Gladney had moments of well having the having the curb your enthusiasm theme playing as as Julio yeah. Jones marches away from you. Yeah, and, and Ryan is throwing this as he's falling down. Like it's clearly like desperate. Julio's not open yet. He's throwing it up without Julio being open. Julio knows that the space is probably behind him. And and Gladney just he has to turn around and he just falls down. Biff's and up. yeah. And God, oh, he's jogging too. Come on, dude. Did he leave because he's injured? No, he's just jogging. Come on, man. The worst part, I think, is that Eric Wilson gets to Julio. Like he catches up to Julio and Julio just stiff arms him. Like, dude, you're a linebacker. Yeah, he was fear. he was stiff armed while Julio Jones made it into the end zone, and that like, wasn't even, even like, that wasn't even the easiest touchdown that the Falcons ended up getting that half. No, the Hayden Hurst one. Oh my, yeah. So, so this one I had to watch three times because I couldn't figure out what happened, um, which matches the Vikings. So, uh, the Falcons motion pre snap that changes the the gap assignments and the coverage rules. So Eric Hendricks is communicating to the rest of the of the of the front um, that you know whatever that they have to do this now, and he and Todd Davis seem to be having a discussion. Then the play starts, and uh, they both pick up Todd Davis and Eric Hendricks both pick up the same receiver running uh, inside like a slant or something like that. Um, and uh, and Hayden Hurst is who now motioned to the opposite side. I, I think he he was the motion man too. Is running. Um, a crosser just uh, just below him, and no one picks him up. And I'm really confident it was supposed to be Todd Davis who picks him up. Uh, and and that doesn't happen. He's wide open. Matt Ryan is like, yeah, that's exactly why we called this play. Throws it to him. Hayden Hurst just walks in, like, what, 35 yards? That dude is, like, older than half the Vikings' defense, and it's, like, his fourth year in the NFL. Um, the fact that they let that happen is just – it's brutal. And that is an example of – maybe the injuries are impacting the Vikings a lot, right? Because Todd Davis isn't on the field if the Vikings, you know, have Anthony Barr, right? Like, you don't have to worry about that then. But that's that's kind of what you're dealing with. And so you end up with that kind of coverage confusion that leads to, like, an easy touchdown. And the thing is, if you're, like, a, a pretty good team defensively, you can have some of these coverage breakdowns and be fine, right? Because, okay, you give up a touchdown here, but you're going to close up. So that's going to be one of their only two touchdowns that game, and they'll get maybe another field goal. But the Vikings are not good. So they have, they've got bad plays like this, like the Dantzler play at the beginning um, against against Julio, who gets the corner route in. Dantzler should have been uh, leveraged inside in cover two because he's got help on the inside with Harrison Smith. Instead, he leverages outside. Julio pushes off. He gets a touchdown on the corner route. Gladney, another play that's just bad execution more than anything else. You're playing poorly because you've got players who don't play well yet, if they're ever going to play well. Who knows about Gladney and Dancer uh, long term? But sometimes you just have a coverage confusion. It's an error. The offense calls the right play. They know exactly what's going to get you confused. They call that play. You give it up, and, and you're still a good defense, right? And that's not what's happening here. The Vikings are a bad defense that have players that are just not good enough yet and then also are making these mistakes that are just mental errors that need to be like kind of cleared up. And so, and this is why it's not just Cousins' fault. Like, yeah, you throw three picks, you're probably going to lose the game, which in some ways makes it the quarterback's fault. But in other ways, you can't just give 35 free yards to Hayden freaking Hurst, right? Like, it's everybody's fault, really. Like, who played well? Yannick Ngakwe, Justin Jefferson, maybe some offensive linemen, but it's it's no unit was spared in terms of you know, the Vikings being able to, to, to play this one out. No. Um, let's see. Did, did any offensive line play well? Uh, well, you know, we can, we can, we can talk about that in, in just a second. I just wanted to sure. add that, you know, you had mentioned people on the Vikings jogging after Julio. Everyone had appeared to be jogging after Hayden Hurst. Like it, it didn't appear that anyone had any desire 
to to actually like run after Hayden Hurst, despite the fact that he was ten yards away from them. But just like that overall feeling of, oh God, really? We allowed that to happen? Just seemed to permeate the entire defense at that point. Like that. Ugh. Yeah, and 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 you know me, I I absolutely hate body language stuff, right? I never know what anyone's thinking. I don't want to speculate on it. But, you know, they seem pretty defeated at yeah, that point. That Like, like I'm watching the All-22. Harrison Smith's trying to run it down. He just gets blocked. Great. Harrison Smith's trying. That's about it. I, it doesn't even look like Cameron Dancer is trying all that hard. I don't know if he ever would have gotten an angle. Maybe he's just making a decision to kind of preserve whatever. But, like, that's, like, frustrating to watch. Um, it was fourth and one too, right? Like if you're not watching for like underneath crossers on fourth and one, I, it's a coverage confusion, right? They, they, they couldn't figure out their coverage assignment. So they probably were looking for, you know, those crossers, but Hey, it's play action fourth and one. That's when you call play action. And, uh, Harrison Smith has the outside receiver going in. Todd Davis picks up that outside receiver and, and Harrison Smith is like, this is my assignment. I don't know what you're doing. And they're both covering this guy. And, and of course, Hayden Hurst is wide open. So yeah, you got to be watching with you. You have to have a plan for crossers on fourth and one. Cause that's exactly what you call on short yardage situation. Cause you need to get rid of the ball quick because they're expecting you to run the ball. And so they're going to run blitz. And when they find out it's not a run, they're going to continue their blitz and go after the quarterback. You've got half a second, which means that the only plays available to you really are quick ones. You can still have deep routes, right? You can still have, you know, I, I, I think actually last year, Kirk Cousins hit uh, a third and short or a fourth and short for a deep one. He actually tried it, obviously, against Green Bay, um, where you can have like a quick, deep throw so long as the receiver wins off of press. But primarily, you got to be concerned about those middle coverage routes um, where where they're testing you on crossers. And they they couldn't pick it up. And, and maybe it's on Harry. Maybe he should have played zone on the outside and let Todd Davis pick up um, whoever this other guy is. I think it's another tight end. Um and uh and and maybe Harrison Smith should have gone out. I don't know. But um yeah, it it's yeah, I mean the effort afterwards, I don't like I don't if they tried harder, would they have tackled him? Probably not. But it's like I think you're I think you're right. It's an indication that at that point, yeah, they they probably felt the uh defeated, right? Yeah. It's forty to fifteen and uh and they score. <laughs> like Like really cool. the we <sighs> We're going to we're going to hear from we're going to hear about that one on Monday sort of thing. So yeah. a lot was said over this weekend about how Drew Simia was going to be out and his uh, replacement in quotation marks was going <laughs> to be starting. How did Ezra how did Ezra Cleveland do this weekend? Uh, I warned you every I, I, I wasn't just the I wasn't the only one, but like we warned you. It can always get worse. And technically, I would say he didn't necessarily play worse. But the 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 discomforting thing is that you could make the case that he did. Now, his PFF grade, I think, is like much higher than Samia's was last week. Um, but that's like it's like 43 to like 20, whatever, right? Like that's not we're 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 comparing like just turds to turds at that point. They're both bad. Um I think Ezra Cleveland plays worse than Samia. The difference is that he didn't commit any penalties. And so the announcers weren't talking about his level of play. We didn't see a replay that isolated specifically that player. So it was very easy for us to say that Samia um, played worse than Cleveland. But uh, Cleveland was directly responsible for uh, the lone sack. He was responsible for, I believe, every quarterback hit that wasn't like a naked bootleg. Um, he allowed, I think two other pressures, if I remember correctly. Um, and if not, I, I was logging his win loss rate, I think, I think he gave up a pressure and then he also had two more like losses that didn't turn into pressure. And actually I thought he was worse in the running game. Like I think, so someone tweeted, out, I think it was Eric tweeted out the PFF grades and, and Ezra Cleveland ended up with a 43.8. And, uh, and I, I tweeted at Eric. Yeah. PFF was definitely generous with his run block grades because, uh, I mean, he was I, arguably almost as bad at run blocking as he was at pass blocking. I mean, he was he was not fit to play, and that it becomes very clear. That's why the Vikings weren't playing him. Like, duh, and 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 which is why I didn't like love the O'Neill versus Rashad Hill comparisons, right? O'Neill 
uh, gets drafted in the second round, um, is playing behind clearly a backup, um, Rashad Hill. Rashad Hill gets an injury that's an excuse to play O'Neal. O'Neal plays well enough, he secures the job. Great, right? But, you know, it feels like the Vikings had to be forced to play O'Neal. But I actually, I think that, you know, because O'Neal is a developmental tackle, he played left tackle in college, he's playing right tackle here. It probably took a little bit of time. He probably wasn't ready right away. And at some point, you know, they they found essentially an excuse to play him. But the difference is, O'Neal was the primary bat. Someone goes down, they immediately go to O'Neal. They're like, all right, time to go. You're ready. That wasn't the case with Ezra Cleveland. Somebody had to go down, and then somebody else had to go down. And then they were like, all right, uh, this is where we're at. Need um, a body. Need a body. And and the, and the worst thing is, well, not the worst thing, but one of the most indicative things is there were multiple reports coming out of practice this week, or this last week, that um, – Cleveland was rotating at right guard in practice. Like they weren't even sure they wanted to play him. Um, and uh, there's one report, I think, from Gessling that uh, he was rotating with Brett Jones and another report from somebody else. I wish I could remember. I think maybe it was Courtney Cronin. Maybe it was Chris Thomason um, that he was rotating with Oliudo. And maybe all three of them were rotating on different days. Who knows? Maybe some agent is lying to some reporter. I don't know. But the fact of the matter is there's, an indication there's a rumor that he didn't even win the backup backup right guard job, right like they were just like okay well there's an opportunity for you to play but this guy that we have decided is a center for like three straight years even though we ran out of bodies at guard like we just ran out of guards and we were still like no we're gonna take a second look at this guy like that's that's maybe what happened right that's a pretty good indication that maybe things aren't aren't all there um, Zimmer said after the game, you know, people asked you, hey, how did Ezra Cleveland play? Um, and Zimmer said, you know, I, those interior guys, it's hard to tell. Um, and then I think, was it on on Monday, the presser, he was like, you know, he did some good, he did some bad, he was over-aggressive, he got out of position here, some execution errors here. You know, he didn't want to throw his rookie under the bus, I get it. But, yeah, I mean, he was just awful. Uh, and, and just to kind of, you know, one of the things I do in this podcast is I extend the Twitter fights into – into into me winning them because they don't get an opportunity to respond um, which you know that's what happens when you get to control the debate right um but I, I i said that he was worse than than samia and um someone was like well i mean he's going up against pro bowler grady jarrett right which uh you know you gotta you gotta come to this, you know, he's going up against pro bowler. what did you expect and it's just like well, first of all, did you cut Samia the slack? Because he went up against like DeForest Buckner and J.J. Watt. Like, I, I don't want to disrespect Grady Jarrett, but those dudes are playing at a different level right now. They're playing way better than Grady Jarrett is, right? And and Grady Jarrett's a really good player. He is a Pro Bowl quality player. There's no question about that. But it's J.J. Watt who was able to play inside a lot this last week or the, these past couple of weeks. Um, it's DeForest Buckner, who's having just a monstrous year. I think he might be, right now, the second-best interior defender in the NFL. Like, he's playing lights out this year, right? Um, and then, uh, I mean, oh, and and and, and, uh, and Simmons, Jeffrey Simmons, who's, who's playing really well as well. I think he's playing about as well as Grady Jarrett. And so, Samia has three games against these guys, and, and we're not going to give him the benefit of the doubt, but it, Grady Jarrett? I don't know. That's the Grady Jarrett's better than any of those three guys. And so, I mean, that's just, that's the nature of the position. He's going to have to go up against Akeem Hicks this year. If Kenny Clark gets healthy again, he's going to have to go up against him uh, this year. You know, he's lucky that Vita Vea is injured um, because, you know, he doesn't have to go up against him, but that's still, you might have to go up against Adama Kung Su, right? Like that's on the schedule, dude. Uh, <laughs> there's like a lot that's still left for you to have to do. Um, and, uh, and, and we can't just be like, man, he played Grady Jarrett. You got to cut him some slack. No, that's the level of play that's expected of you at the position. You're a second round pick. Maybe, you know, maybe because you're a developmental pick, we can't evaluate you in terms of, uh, you know, your rookie level performance. And that's fine. I like agree with that kind of long-term in terms of, you know, projecting that out. What that means is that it shifts the responsibility from him, I, which I guess I get, to the Vikings for not having a plan at guard, which they already didn't have a plan because they're playing Dakota Dozier, right? Like, yeah, I don't know. It's, total, it's a rant. Total side <laughs> note while we're ranting, how on earth did Bill O'Brien not trade J.J. Watt? It seemed like he was trading everyone from that organization except J.J. Watt. I, I just think J.J. Watt has too much power. 
right? Like, when did Bill O'Brien get fired? Well, it was the week that J.J. Watt called him out in practice and said he was a bad coach. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I, I think as soon as Bill O'Brien thinks about trading J.J. Watt, Watt tells the other team, I'm not going to agree to a trade. The team declines the trade. Watt goes to the owner and he's like, hey, Cal. I think his name is Cal. If Mr. not, for, if not, that's what yeah. J.J. calls you. Yeah, that's what J.J. Cal. <laughs> I'm I Bill. am Houston. No. Cal. <laughs> Cal. I am Houston. Do you know what Bill O'Brien just tried? Coach O'Brien? I'm not going to call him that because we don't have to worry about that title after this discussion. You know what Bill <laughs> O'Brien did? He tried to trade Houston. And then he's gone. So that's why J.J. Watt didn't get traded. He tried to trade Houston. Only you can trade out of Houston. <laughs> like... Yeah, that it it just it does surprise me just in retrospect how Bill O'Brien managed to get that entire team outside of Deshaun Watson. But it's like JJ Watts like the only guy who who like survived that. You have to yeah, I like the idea that right after he called him out in practice, he tried he he could have theoretically tried to trade JJ Watt and JJ goes over to the owner like, "No, no, no, no. We're not having this." Do you realize how much money I helped raise after the hurricane? This guy right. needs to go. That's, ugh. <laughs> I mean, what what positives do we can we take away from for the Vikings uh, this game, other than Justin Jefferson now is the only reason to watch. Um, the thing is, like, how much? Like, how much do we want to give Jefferson credit? Like, I'm writing the players of the week piece, and. Uh, and I'm not putting Jefferson on the list. I think he had more receiving yards than anyone else this week. And um, he had 89 yards through three quarters, which is good. Like, there's no question about that. That's You, you get a rookie receiver, gets 89 yards, you're happy. Um, but, you know, is it really fun to watch? Well, actually, no, you're right. Actually, I, I'll take this all back. It is fun to watch him beat up on Kendall Sheffield down 20 points. <laughs> um but yeah, I mean, he he roasted that dude too. Like, I, like so. One of the things it's garbage time, right? You got to take that into account. Was was that impacting the way the Falcons played? Initially, it doesn't look like that, but I actually think it was right. Like, I think um, if you're the Falcons, you you play a bunch of inside levers, try to get people to go inside. Um, you protect against outside. Um, you've got you know cloud safeties that are up a little bit higher than normal. You prevent big plays that hasten possessions and stuff like that. So he's probably he's probably playing a little bit easier in terms of coverage than um, than you know normal, right? So there's a, a, a degree of difficulty curve here that I'd want to put into place. Um, but you you take all of this together, right? And uh, and you can't be anything but happy. I mean, he's a really great route runner at this point. He's really good off the line of scrimmage, something, you know, I had no idea if he was going to be good off the line of scrimmage, right? Um, he's got a fair amount of speed. That's really fantastic. So, yeah, I don't... Um, contested catches. Yeah, he's got contested catches, which uh, he was the best contested catch receiver in college, right? His final year. So, yeah, I mean, he is pretty fun to watch. Uh, that might be the thing, right? Like, you know, w- when the Vikings were were screwy, you'd be like, yeah, he's got Adrian Peterson. That's fun. They'll they'll grind out to a 21-13 loss, but Adrian Peterson's going to run over some dudes. He's going to have like two or three plays that are going to make it worth sitting through the sludge of a terrible Alex Smith team versus a terrible call or ter- versus a terrible uh, our the the quarterback that we said just wasn't very good. The guy who likes to or uh, Christian Ponder. There we go. I was going to say his wife likes to block everyone on Twitter. Uh, versus a terrible Christian Ponder squad. But Adrian's going to go out. He's going to have two or three runs during that game that are going to, like, suck you back in. It could be, like, 21 nothing, But Adrian's going to have two or three plays that are just going to be like, yep, yep, okay, yep, there, there it is. And then that's kind of how you survived some of those really lean years. Justin Jefferson is doing a hell of a job this game. Yeah, he, he, might, he might be that guy. Uh, he had well, – because it was just – since he started, he's had one dud, right? He's had three 100-plus yard games. And he's had one, was it a 20-yard game? I don't know. It doesn't matter. Um, right? 
It was against the like did he did he uh, did he just not produce against the Seahawks? Oh, the Seahawks found a way. If the Seahawks put a decent guard, put a right. decent defender. Twenty-three yards. Yeah. yeah. So um, that's about it. Um, otherwise, 175, 103, 166. Plus, he's got you know the the statistical backbone of having the twenty-six and the forty-four at the beginning of the season before he started. So, yeah, he's fun to watch. Um, I, I would say right now he's probably in second place for offensive player of the year behind Justin Herbert because quarterbacks always get that boost and, and Herbert's just really fun to watch. Um, but right now I think he's playing probably better than any offensive rookie, um, even in – well, except for Tristan Wirfs. I think it's it's like Tristan Wirfs and then in in voting, probably Justin Herbert, but I think in, in talent and value, probably Justin Jefferson. And then, you know, maybe – would have been nice to say CD Lamb, but he just he didn't really do much last night uh, or the other night. Um, CD Lamb is in that conversation. Um, Justin Herbert's in that conversation. Joe Burrow is playing well. Jedrick Wills is in that conversation. Um, but yeah, I, I think Jefferson is like playing at uh, the highest level that an offensive rookie can play right now. It's really fun, and is pretty much the only reason to watch this team right now. Uh, is there any other thing that we need to mention about this game before we talk about what everyone seems to want to talk about? (laughs) Um, it's not much. I mean, it's just like everything else about this game is really just about the season, right? Which is what everyone wants to talk about. So, um, I'll, I'll say, I'll say this, which will tie a little bit together, which is, um, Good teams get to have games like this, right? Average teams do not. Bad teams don't. If you're an average team that's a little bit unlucky and then you have a game like this, that's it. That's all you have. Um, and and the Vikings seem like an average team that's had a little bit of bad luck, right? Like two one-point games, they don't get that fourth and one against Seattle. Um, an average team that punches above its weight still doesn't get it done. That happens. You'll be able to punch above your weight sometime later in the season. Uh, and then... Um, but you don't get to make any mistakes on your way to the playoffs if that's what's happening. Um, the Vikings are not a good team. They don't get to over, they don't have the opportunity to overcome that because there can be good one in four teams, right? There can be, it's happened in the past. I think was it 2018 Texans might've been one of them, um, where, you know, you, you get, you get some bad luck, you play poorly, but you don't, you don't have this game. And so this is a really good indication of who the, who the Vikings are. I think they're much better than a one in five team. I don't think that's actually very controversial to say either. I think from a talent perspective, even from an execution perspective of, of, of how they've played over the past six games, right? They're better than a typical one in five team. It doesn't matter after a game like this. So, you know, they could go 600 for the rest of the schedule. That's six wins. Great. You go seven to nine, you miss out on some draft picks. And I hate tanking. I think they should play to win, but you know, it, it doesn't matter. So that's, that's, it's not about the game, but it's about the game because this game tells us a lot about the Vikings. You know, it's, this might be a controversial statement before I say it. This team might not be good. <laughs> uh, the evidence would suggest that they are not um, a high level team. Yeah, this is, and I, I had said before, like people, we we got so many questions on this, and I'll 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 handle it here in a second. But we got so many questions on the que- on on Spielman. We got so many questions on Zimmer as to whether or not the two of them should be shot into a shot by a cannon into the sun. Uh, and I, I had said before, I was like, I'm not worried about them until Ziggy Wolf comes out and says he has full confidence in them. At that point, <laughs> right. they're screwed. But until that point. <laughs> I still think they could, they could potentially uh, survive this, but man, that uh, we're starting to see all of the things that you see in other failed teams right before their coach goes. You start to see incredible inconsistencies. You start to see a lack of like, I really don't understand why this is going on. Like it, it's got some some ugly parallels to when Childress went it's got some ugly parallels to other coaches like man this is this is not good so let's go to the top of the mailbag uh for those of you just joining us 
welcome back. And let's go right into why you tuned in to Norse Code. Uh, the first question is, is well, it's, it's it's a little different than, than, than the regular one. Uh, Abdel Naderhive asks, I have two questions. Number one, how do I fix the chemical imbalances in my brain that led me to become a Vikings fan? Um, I find that talk therapy for two to four hours a week helps. <laughs> so find a podcast host or co-host. Uh, number two, is there any way Spielman could get let go without Zimmer or are they truly a combo deal? I don't want to punish Spielman for his, or I want to rather punish Spielman for his uh, evaluation of Kirk Cousins, and he tried to blot that out like it was a swear word. Alex Johnson <laughs> Fry asks, is firing Zimmer the right move? I'd love to hear a Reef's take on the pros and cons of firing a head coach midseason. Also, is there a serious chance that Andre Patterson becomes our next head coach? Kyle Seagal asks a question that, Sounds like he was wearing pants when he tweeted it out. What tolerance level is there for Zimmer in a losing season? Can the Vikings plunge to the depths of one and five but retain him? Kenneth Allen asks, looking forward, isn't there a serious worry that if we fire Zimmer, we could replace him with a bad head coach? There will be six to eight openings, and what can the Vikings really tempt a good head coach prospect with? They'd be stuck with Kirk for two more years and an aging defense. There are dozens of these questions and these are the only ones i've decided to read but there were a million questions on this reef let's start from the top uh so spielman is is there is there life for zimmer without spielman is there life for spielman without zimmer yeah i think that they're connected um i think ever since not this most recent extension but was it uh two extensions ago um, it was reported that their contracts were synced up. And I think that basically tells you that they're a package deal. Um, Spielman has been a GM for a very long time. Um, I talked to some um, personnel people uh, in college in the NFL about, you know, where, where does Spielman rank, right, among, among executives. And um, wh- one, of the, one, of the thing, one of the funny things about this conversation is they didn't know where to rank the, the – the Patriots because it's like, well, what, what is the GM structure there? Not entirely sure how to do the Chiefs because of Andy Reid and his influence. But, you know, if they're like one and two or one and three or whatever, a lot of them put Spielman in the top ten. Like, he's a pretty good GM. Also, the Vikings haven't won very much under him. So, like, to what extent can you say that he's a GM that can lead you to a Super Bowl? Well, some GMs don't until they do. Right, like uh, like the Eagles GM, who's not Lurie, that's the owner, uh, Howie Roseman, um, remarkable at inner office politics. Turns out, uh, can be good enough of a GM to to bring in a bunch of talent in order to win. Right? Sometimes GMs are are, are bad until they're good, or they're just not good enough, and then they become good. And honestly, I think Spillman is kind of like kind of riding that line, honestly, um, because I think that. Um, he has helped put together some pretty consistently competitive teams through multiple coaching staffs at the same time, right? Like some level of accountability or environment or maybe some sort of shift might might need to be made. And you might be letting go of a top GM prospect um, that, you know, is going to find a great job somewhere else. Who knows, right? That's a possibility. Um, and, and, you know, it would suck to just be like, well, you know, the, the the Vikings had to let, you know, Rick Spielman go. He ends up finding a, a great job and, you know, who's going to need a new GM in, in, in a year? Uh, Arizona, I mean, no one likes Steve Kime in Arizona, but they're doing well, so probably not them. But, Wait, uh, is he the guy who has the Bond, uh, has the Bond villain house or is that their coach? That's the coach. <laughs> okay, just just wanted to double yeah. check that. I couldn't, yeah. I just remember it being Arizona that had the Bond villain like sofa like situation yeah. right yeah but like what, what if spielman replaces joe douglas in new york and he leads to the jets to their first super bowl since joe namath right like i, I mean how stupid are you gonna feel i mean and obviously th- for this conversation to happen people would have to believe that that's not likely so i get it but you know I, I think that he's done fairly well mike zimmer same thing it's hard to be a 600 coach he's relatively close to 600 there's about six other active head coaches with a better record than him um okay so like what do you do like Previously, there were some pretty good arguments that you don't want to hold Zimmer's bad seasons against him, right? Uh, Teddy's knee blew up. Sam Bradford's knee blew up. 
Matt, Castle's ankle blew up. Pretty good excuses. All lower body injury related, but pretty good excuses. This year, you don't really have that. Yeah, you traded Diggs, but like, how 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 strong an argument can you make when Justin Jefferson is like leading all rookies since like 2018 in receiving yardage and leading all rookie or in his like fourth since like uh, 98 in rookies since receiving yardage since uh, for five games, right? Like, how how much of an impact can that really have? Um, okay, you finally you finally had to have a bunch of roster turnover. Okay, but that's why you invested a first round pick in a corner two years ago when you needed an offensive lineman. Plus, you got the offensive lineman you wanted anyway. So, why isn't Mike Hughes ready to play? That's maybe on the coach or the GM, right? Like Holton Hill, he's not like, I mean, he's like a veteran, right? Obviously, he's an undrafted free agent. You can't like expect like everything out of him. But if you're not planning for these windows to close, then what are you doing, right? You cycle through a couple of, of, of edge defenders. Now you don't have a replacement for Everson Griffin. What are you doing? So um, this season, there aren't really a ton of arguments that you can make in their favor, except the fact that they essentially put themselves in a position where they said they could win now, and then they made a bunch of moves that hurt the prospects for winning in 2020 in the hopes of winning in 2021 and 2022. And they, were, and they basically said, no, nah, but still we can win. And they, it turns out they cannot. Um, so... Now what? Now that you've got all of this chaff out of the way, right? All of this stuff about how, you know, Zimmer no longer has those excuses. Because I don't think Anthony Barr, Daniel Hunter getting injured is the same level of, like, excuses the quarterback getting injured. I'm going to always give the coach the benefit of that when a quarterback gets injured. But the other positions, I mean, the Vikings have had good injury luck. Like, it, these these seasons were going to happen, and they didn't have a plan. They didn't have a plan at safety when Harrison Smith was ejected. Um, so they put their nickel corner, who I guess is listed as a safety there, and that didn't work out. Okay, great. Um, they don't really have a bunch of great plans at linebacker, so Anthony Barr gets injured. Now you're scrambling because you're like, well, we got Ryan Connolly from the Giants. We'll play him. Ah, he's bad. What about Hardy Nickerson? We grabbed him in the middle of camp. We didn't even like him enough to sign him at the beginning of camp. Ah, oh, wow, surprise, he's bad. Okay, we'll sign Todd Davis, who just got waived by the Broncos. Oh, he just gave up a touchdown to Hayden Hurst. Like, I mean, if you don't have a plan... Your your bad seasons have to be like six or seven win seasons, which they have been for the Vikings, right? Eight wins, nine wins, you don't make the playoffs. In your good seasons, you make the NFC Championship game, you make the divisional round. That's great. But if your bad season is like this, that's I think when you can have the conversation. So if I'm if I'm the owner, I would probably not fire them, right? Unless like you've got this super insane candidate. That really wants the Vikings, which speaks to some of these other questions. How attractive of a prospect to the Vikings for a head coach? I think reasonably attractive. I don't think they're unattractive. Like, I don't think they're the Jets, right? Like, I think you've got talented players. I think you've got a good locker room. Um, you don't have a second round pick, but you still have a first round pick, right? Which makes it not the Texans, right? So um, it's, it's reasonably good. Okay, fine. You're stuck with Kirk Cousins. Who cares, right? If it, you're, you're not the guy that signed him, you just have, because of the way the cap works, you're stuck with them. Now you get to develop your, the quarterback that you want coming out of the draft, and you're not going to be implicated until that quarterback plays. So I think it's probably fine as a destination. It's not amazing, right? It's not, you know, we've got multiple first-round picks. Um, we've got a bunch of really solid young talent. No, you don't have any cap space. You've got a quarterback you're stuck with. You don't have a second-round pick. But your your plan, your Daniil Hunter's probably going to come back. Um, you might have the ability to, to re-sign Yannick Ngakwe. You've got Eric Hendricks, who's one of the best linebackers in the NFL. You've got maybe Anthony Harris, but you certainly have Harrison Smith. You've got an offensive line that has some pieces, right? Garrett Bradbury didn't play well last week, but he's played well this year. You've got Brian O'Neill. You can figure out what you want to do with Riley. We've got some pieces, and then you've got a really great receiving group. So there, there's pieces here. It's not the Jets, right? You've got draft picks. It's not the Texans. So it's reasonably attractive, but... I don't know that you'll, unless somebody great is in the head coaching ranks that we haven't heard of yet that people are talking about, you know, I don't, I don't know that I would make the move if I'm, you know, Ziggy Wolf. I think that Zimmer's a good coach. I think that that, you know, sometimes it takes a good coach a while to win the Super Bowl. We've all heard of Andy Reid, who's had these bad years, right? Um, so, yeah, I, Zimmer's winning percentage is not that far away from Andy Reid's winning percentage when he signed with the Chiefs. So I, I don't think that this is catastrophically bad, but 
I, you got to answer some questions. Yeah, this is uh, this is not good. This is definitely not the sort of thing that the that you know. Just watching through camp, there were some questions, but it still seemed like this was a pretty talented team. But injuries and then uh, a, a a backfield that you couldn't pick up out of you couldn't pick out out of a lineup if you tried. <laughs> like this is bad. This is. This is the sort of thing that gets coaches fired. This is the sort of thing that gets GMs fired. You find yourself watching the pressers or you find yourself watching interviews afterwards where they're doing the exact same things as other coaches who are about to get fired. They don't have answers. They don't they don't understand how there are such inconsistencies. That said, Adam Gase probably needs to be fired into the sun. Or at least, you know, a law needs to be put in place to keep Adam Gase from coaching again in the NFL, much like there was just an unspoken rule that Rex Ryan needs to never coach again. Like, it's that sort of thing. Um, But, man, this is – this isn't good. Uh, There is a question about whether or not you think uh, Andre Patterson would become the uh, the next head coach. I don't know. That's that's an interesting one. So I think think from a prediction standpoint – I think the Wolves really want a forward-thinking head coach. I think they like – this is all speculative. But I think they like a lot of these offensive head coaches and how well they've done. I think they like the concept of being at the forefront of innovation. I think they like Kevin Stefanski. Like, I think that's the whole reason that this came up in the first place, that uh, last year – uh, heading into the playoffs that that if Zimmer didn't beat the Saints, he was going to get fired because they really wanted Stefanski, and they lost him, right? They lost him to the Browns, and Stefanski's doing a good job. The Browns, you know, Baker Mayfield's an issue, but Stefanski's doing a good job. So it, it might feel like that, but you, you can't just say, well, uh, the quarterback's coach right now, Kevin Stefanski was a quarterback's coach. Well, Clint Kubiak, maybe he's a good head coach. You can't just say that. You don't know, right? Adam Gase was a quarterback's coach. Hell, he coordinated one of the greatest offenses of the past decade. Kind of, you know, Peyton Manning may have played a role in that, but you know, yeah, Adam possibly. Gaze, quarterback, just, just a bit, right? So you can't and like you know, John DeFilippo was the was the quarterbacks coach for Carson Wentz, was the red zone coordinator for that team. They won a Super Bowl. He's you know the next uh, you know prodigy, and you know now now he he just got fired from Jacksonville last year, right? Like you don't know, right? So unless there's a coaching candidate that is really drawing a ton of buzz. I, I don't know that they're going to go anywhere, but I think the way the Wolves probably, I don't know, but the way I think the Wolves probably think about this is they want somebody that's pretty friendly to uh, analytics. They probably want somebody who's offensive. Um, I think your interim coach is maybe Gary Kubiak. It really depends on whether or not he thinks that that's kind of appropriate given his health situation. You know, he uh, didn't even want to be offensive coordinator last year because of the health concerns. And then he decided to take it on, but you know, from a booth and and with kind of maybe less responsibility than typical, um, uh, because of the because of the health concerns. So maybe Gary Kubiak, depending on whether or not he thinks that's appropriate for him. But if it's not Gary, I think Andre Patterson is the guy, right? Because I don't think you give it to Clint or Adam. Um, so I, I think from an interim perspective, maybe. But I think from the perspective of what the Wilfs probably want based off of, you know, the the Stefanski Zimmer stuff from last year. Um I I would say that Patterson is probably not the next head coach, which sucks because I think he certainly deserves an opportunity. Like he's um from, you know, like given that we assume that people who are good at uh, one level of coaching will be good at the next level of coaching. There's no evidence of that, but He's maybe the best defensive line coach in the league. He deserves a real defensive coordinating job first, but he also deserves uh, just a shot at being a head coach, given that he's performed well. So, but I, I don't think that the Wolves, and I, I'd love to be wrong about this, but I, I don't think that the Wolves will be the ones that would give him that opportunity. All right, Damian Barrett asks a kind of interesting question about uh, about like stylistic uh, play here. Uh, Damian Barrett asks, if tactical trends tend to be cyclical, would the Vikings be better to ditch our current style even if it means we're late to the pass-happy party or stick with running the ball and a defensive coach to catch the wave when things turn? So football tactics tend to be cyclical only within – within the atmosphere that they're in. So, and by that, I mean, 
uh, coverage tends to be cyclical. You, you might invent a new coverage, like when zone coverage was, in, or when yeah, when zone coverage was invented to take care of um, some of the speedy receivers that were uh, exploiting the league, or when um, or when man match principles were invented um, to kind of give you a new look on what zone looks like. That, but like for the most part, cover two is in, and then cover three is in, uh, then cover six is in, then cover four is in right now. Uh, and and the Vikings might be ahead of the curve with with uh, cover two again. That's cyclical, right? Um, going with you know three wide receivers that doesn't seem to be as cyclical, but you know it, the league has faded in and out of that. Um, you know the way backfield formations work. We've seen more pistol. We've seen more wishbone. Pistol is a new innovation, but it kind of builds on some of the stuff that we actually saw in football back in the forties. Uh, read option. Um, is something that existed in old football and then became that's what's cyclical. There is no evidence that run pass balance is cyclical. Um, it has just been since this since 1978, it has just been moving towards pass happy football. There was like a period in like the 1950s when passing was efficient, they passed the ball a lot, and then they just started running more and more and more. Um, until you get to essentially what's the dead ball era in 1975, 1977. Uh, and then since then, it's just been increasing running the ball. So I don't think that you can catch any wave where you where you run the ball. Like I, I think that you just got to bite the bullet and be a team that's efficient at passing and that throws the ball a lot when uh, the game is in balance. So no, I, I wouldn't say that that's part of approaching football cyclically um, from a tactical perspective. I think that's just within the specific frameworks that one builds tactics. So in coverage shells, in formation tendencies, you know, that kind of stuff, not in run pass decisions. Pretty much. You just want to be in a situation like the Titans have right now. I I mean, yeah, they're, they've got one of the most efficient passers in football. They've got a running back that might matter. Um, they run the ball obviously really well. Derrick Henry just went off for like 212 yards, 9.7 yards after uh, 9.7 to carry, 7.1 after contact. That's not bad. Uh, having a guy who's like leading the league in passer rating, also not bad. You know, other than the whole COVID thing, the Titans are having a really good season this year. <laughs> hey, I mean, the COVID thing seemed to have worked out for them too. <laughs> yeah, turns out. The, the NFL has no has nothing to, to, to penalize them for, so they're just not going to do it. It's like, yeah, great. They're fine. <laughs> and they have a chip on their shoulder because they didn't like how people wrote and, and tweeted about them for, for, for COVID stuff. So, yeah, that's this. This all this all works for them. It'd be like if it be like if, if, if the Houston Astros managed to to make it into the world series this year, they were thankfully defeated, but it, it, it'd be like that sort of thing. Like, yeah, yeah. You know, nobody believed in us. Yeah. Because you guys were cheating and there's video evidence of it. Well, the, uh, the, they were asked, like, I, I guess they have exit pressers in baseball. They were asked like, Hey, so, uh, how, how did that revenge tour goes? Like, Oh, I don't know if anyone was having a revenge tour. We just wanted to, to play the best baseball we could. And it's like, you listening to yourself right now? Man, screw you even more, yeah. dude. <laughs> Be like, I'm even more upset that the twins were swept by you a-holes. All right. Uh, also from Damian Barrett, uh, I just binge-watched uh, binge watched Utopia, and I'm now fully convinced that Arif is a Mr. Rabbit-esque mastermind who engineered and released COVID in order to, uh, to, in order to stop large gatherings at Thanksgiving, thus negating the need for turkeys. Am I wrong? Uh, I... I'm not committing any acts of biological warfare that you're willing to admit to on a podcast. Yes. <laughs> uh, wait, are, I are podcasts admissible of- in court? I forget. Oh, they have to be. There's, there's, yeah, there's this. Okay. never mind. You're, yeah. Let's, we can, we can. Wait, if, if I said, I hear that James is bioengineering uh, viral particles that could kill people. That's not a- a- admissible in court, right? That's probably hearsay. This is a great intro to Arif Hassan's legal corner, which <laughs> is the next question. Uh, but uh, but yeah, uh, but if I said it, that that counts. That's you. You can take that to prison. Uh, oh, specifically, yeah. me. You can so take me to prison if I had said that. Yeah, I suppose that's right. Uh, Ryan asks for Arif's legal corner. Yes, I'm making up new corners. Well, for for the for the 
prototype corner, a refasan, yes. Uh, how does the June 1st designation work with Kirk's guarantee language? Asking for no particular reason. Um, so all it does is it impacts how the cap hit gets distributed. So um, if the Vikings, and actually, so I'm, I'm going to do this so I don't screw it up, and I'm probably still going to screw it up, but I'm going to do it in a way where I'm going to hold something else accountable. If they cut Kirk Cousins right now, no post one, uh, June 1st designation, they take a $41 million net cap hit. If they use the post June 1st designation, according to Spot Track, what ends up happening is that $42 million of dead cap hits them in 2020, which, because he only has a $30 million hit this year, means there is a negative net cap savings. Um, but you also take on $20 million in 2021 dead cap, which is what I originally thought before I started fiddling around with the over-the-cap calculator. If they did the post-June 1st release next year, after March 3rd of 2021, then they take a 2021 dead cap hit of apparently $66 million and a 2022 dead cap hit of $10 million, which I guess saves them because if you do it after March 3rd of 2021, he actually does get $45 million new and guaranteed money, which goes against your cap. So it's all very complicated, but the point is that your signing bonus salary gets pushed into next year. Every other piece of guaranteed salary stays in this year. Um, so there is not a moment where a June 1st release net saves you money uh, for 2020 or 2021. You're just you're just boned. It's the Kirk Cousins contract is structured in such a way that if you want to cut him, you got to do it on like March second. And any other day that you cut him, you take like sixty million dollars against the cap. Ouch. Uh, DJ asks, can we expect a market correction for a backup quarterback talent, or is thirty three million the new normal? He's not like he's not a backup quarterback. That's the problem. Well, he was I mean, talking about if he keeps throwing like this, he's not going to be the starter for very long. Although I'm trying to imagine Sean Mannion th doing much better. Right. Yeah. The thing is, like, you take a look at Kirk Cousins' performance this past weekend, and and you'd say, and, and I run through a bunch of quarterbacks, and a bunch of people would say, yeah, I'd rather have that guy. Like, if I I would say, okay, you saw Kirk Cousins. Would you rather have um, Jimmy Garoppolo? And a bunch of people listening to this might say yes, right? Would you rather have Ryan Fitzpatrick? And a bunch of people listening to this might say yes. And honestly, based off how he's played this year, despite the fact that he literally just got benched for Tua, uh, you know, maybe they've got an argument. Would you rather have Gardner Minshew? And a bunch of people might say yes. What about Baker Mayfield? Probably fewer people, but some people would say yes. What about uh, Nick Foles? Probably way fewer people, but some people might say yes. What about Dwayne Haskins? And that's when you get to know. And now I'm at the person ranked 29th in adjusted net yards per attempt. And so that feels like a backup, right? It feels like we're talking about a guy ranked 26th, 27th in the NFL. And he has played a lot like that this year. But when the Vikings signed him, he was, after even after you exclude garbage time, he was a, a top 10-ish, top 12 quarterback, right? And so the answers to these questions would have been no, right? We would have a lot of people would rather have taken Kirk Cousins over Jimmy Garoppolo. A lot of people would have taken Kirk Cousins. Way more people would have taken him over Ryan Fitzpatrick. Right? They would have taken him over whatever that year's version of Gardner Minshew was, whatever that year's version of Baker Mayfield was. Um, you know, whatever that version of um, you know Philip Rivers. Right? Because Philip Rivers then was the starting quarterback. Philip Rivers now, you know, is coming off a really hot game, but there were a bunch of questions about whether or not he could be a quarterback in Indianapolis uh, two games ago. So. Uh, bunch of questions about those guys and you end up with actually i would take kirk cousins over this top 15 quarterback i would take kirk cousins over this top 20 quarterback so that's what happened so that's why he signed for 33 million is he gonna bounce back you know i've said this a couple of times now i think yes i still think yes but every time i say it he just plays worse um so so maybe you should stop talking <laughs> yeah it's clearly because i'm saying it uh but yeah, I mean, fundamentally, he's a more talented quarterback than the level of play he's putting together. Uh, if the Vikings cut him and they take on like $60 million in cap hit, right, then he's going to get signed by somebody. And probably not for very much because there's probably offset language, so he doesn't have to sign for much in order to get like $40 million this year. But assuming that there's no offset language and the Vikings cut him right now, 
I mean, he probably signs with the first, probably with the Cleveland Browns, right? Because the problems with Baker Mayfield, the familiarity with Stefanski, the um, fact that they played well together, the fact that they've got the best offensive line in the NFL right now, the fact that they've got two or three really good receivers to work with. He probably thrives in Cleveland right now. So they probably sign him right away for however much money Cleveland has. But excluding that interesting situation, San Francisco takes a look at him, of course. Um, I, I would think uh, that, you know, the the Jets or the Giants take a look at him. Um, he gets he gets signed, and he gets signed for you know less than thirty million dollars, but he gets signed for more than twenty, I would think. Um, so, no, he's not a backup quarterback, and he's not going to be a backup quarterback in, unless he continues playing like this. And he had a pretty good game against Seattle. He had a pretty good game against Houston. It's not like he's only played bad this year. You know, he had the Green Bay game, he had the Indianapolis game, he had this game, right? So. I, I, mean, I don't, he's not going to sign for like, you know, a, a backup quarterback money until, you know, he kind of definitively proves that, you know, he's Ryan Fitzpatrick and he's only got a good couple of games in him every year. Yeah. We're not at the level of like a Jake DeLome style skid into obscurity yet. We right, still yeah, have exactly. a chance. I think that's a great, yeah, yeah. We, we still, de- it's still in play. Don't get me wrong, <laughs> but we're not there yet uh brad davis asks a bit about the draft given that the quarterbacks are the most important position in the nfl do teams typically under invest in the position it seems like there's a disconnect between how we talk about outsized importance that a quarterback has on a team's success and how much draft capital usually teams invest in them If you could spend a first round draft pick every year and expect a top five or top 10 quarterback play, wouldn't that be worth it, especially given most quarterbacks career lengths? From that perspective, it seems like that like the position, despite salaries, is actually undervalued from this from the perspective of a draft. For example, if Trevor Lawrence is a generational talent and I hate that term, it seems used almost every year. Truth. Uh, would it make sense for the Vikings to give up four years worth of first round draft picks to take him? It seems like we've missed on several first round draft picks in recent years. Like Juan Treadwell, Mike Hughes, Garrett Bradbury. I know it's still early, but not a, re- not a resounding success. The hits include Trey Waynes and Anthony Barr. And I'm not even sure Trey, Trey Waynes is a hit. He didn't really p- play up to his draft position. Given this information, would we not have been better off to sacrifice three to five of those first rounders for Patrick Mahomes or Deshaun Watson, Baker Mayfield or Kyler Murray? Let's let's ignore Mayfield for just a moment. Yeah, so I think that this is largely true, but I think the problem is um, we know that a quarterback isn't enough. We just know that a quarterback is an overwhelmingly critical piece, right? And so you have to, at some point, wrangle with the fact that um, you can, in a sense, you know, as close as you can, guarantee, you know, a high level of play um, from the quarterback position by investing a first round pick in it every year, right? Like, let's say your hit rate is is worse than the rest of the NFL. Like, it's worse, right? That's your bad at value quarterbacks. That's why you embarked on the strategy of drafting a first round quarterback every year. Um, okay, so uh, you know, you start out by sacrificing, you know, four years of first round picks, you got a bad quarterback for the next four years because you're worse than the rest of the NFL. So then you start, you know, you sign a free agent like Kirk Cousins, and then you start drafting a quarterback every single year, wherever you can, right? So, you know, this year it would have been Jordan Love. You know, last year it might have actually been, you know, at, at some point it might have actually been Patrick Mahomes. Um, next year it might be, you know, Trey Lance or Tanner Morgan even, which would be kind of fun. Um, or, uh, or, or whatever, right? Like you're going to cycle through a bunch of these first round picks, maybe Justin Herbert, I guess he went six. So it's not, you know, the same, but you know, that's kind of where you're at. So you're always drafting a quarterback and you're worse, right? You're not as good. So, um, instead of Patrick Mahomes, you get Mitch Trubisky one year, right? But you're still going to hit at about a 40% rate. Like if you're bad at it consistently, you're going to hit at a 40% rate. So long as you keep selecting quarterbacks that are generally agreed upon to be first round picks, because sometimes you're going to get Lamar Jackson with 32 or Teddy Bridgewater is going to at 32, right? So at some point you're going to hit, and you're going to keep drafting those first round quarterbacks. And then you're just not going to have anyone for that guy to throw to. You're not going to have any protection for that guy. You're not going to have enough of a defense because all of those picks that you invested are, uh, your most valuable assets to build those other units. Now, obviously, because you saved a bunch of cap space in just 
drafting first round picks. Um, and you've got like four quarterbacks on the roster that are all like first round picks that are like $3 million, right? You can fill a lot of these holes in free agency, which is great. Um, but I, I still think you're, you're kind of behind because you have, you've, now you're at the point where you're over-invested. You have guaranteed that you've got a pretty good quarterback. You've got Lamar Jackson, um, but you don't have the infrastructure around them. And I think a really good example of that is the Houston Texans. There's nothing around Deshaun Watson. Like, they've built up some of that offensive line. Like, Laramie Tunsil is legitimately playing really, really well. But Titus Howard's awful, and he's a first-round pick, right? Um, you know, he's throwing to, yeah, Brandon Cooks and Will Fuller are fine, but, you know, you don't have, like, a, a good receiver. You have a bunch – or a great receiver. You've got a bunch of pretty good receivers, and there's no defense. Uh, over the last three weeks, Deshaun Watson has led the league in expected points added. He's led the league in adjusted net yards per attempt. He has been the most efficient quarterback over half of the season that we've played so far, and what has that gotten them, right? It's gotten them a fired coach. Um, so the supporting cast does still matter, even if you've got a really high-level quarterback. We could even look at what has happened – when when quarterbacks that we know are pretty good have lost a significant amount of the supporting cast. So when Philip Rivers is really good, lost a good portion of the supporting cast, fell off a, a little bit, right? Um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, Tom Brady has had some years where just, I mean, the past couple of years, he hasn't had a good supporting cast uh, and he's fallen off, right? Aaron Rodgers hasn't had a very good supporting cast and he fell off and, and suddenly he's, you know, playing out of his mind um, with like the same bad supporting cast, but that's something to consider. And so, you still like the goal isn't to 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 be as good at quarterback as possible. It's to win, right? And so at some point you have to remove yourself from that strategy. And if you're if you're in this situation where you're worse than the rest of the league, at some point you're gonna have to sign that quarterback um, because uh, you want to invest around them, and so you're gonna p- put those picks around them. So I think that you're right that you fundamentally that that the team's fundamentally underinvest in quarterback. That I think the Packers were right to select a quarterback, even if they thought Aaron Rodgers was good. They probably should not have then selected a running back and then a blocking tight end after that. They probably should have dipped into a historic receiver class. Um, but I get I get what the Packers picked Jordan Love. It's really funny for the memes, but it's also pretty smart strategy. It's how they got Aaron Rodgers in the first place. Uh, Patrick Mahomes picked, even though they had just signed Alex Smith. Um, that's all great, right? Like I think that you should, every couple of years, invest in a quarterback, uh, maybe every year, depending on the pick, right? Like the New England Patriots... They invested uh, a second round pick into uh, Jimmy Garoppolo. They invested a fourth round pick into Ryan Mallett. They invested um, like a seventh round pick into Matt Castle. The Matt Castle pick played out beautifully, right? Like the fact that they didn't make the playoffs that year is really just a product of how weird that year was because they they won like ten games, right? Um, so like, I think that you should pick a quarterback every year. Um, I uh, Dak Prescott was picked when they had Tony Romo. I, I don't necessarily think it has to be a first round pick, but I, I think that this is. Th- this is the direction you should overcorrect in. I agree. Like, I think maybe not a first round pick every year, but I think you should consider it. Um, and and I think that if you're if you're at the third round and you haven't picked a quarterback in two years, you should probably think about it. So I like this question a lot. I think it goes a little bit too far because um, you, you're bankrupting the rest of the team in order to get that quarterback. And at that point, you've suddenly found a way in the NFL, for the, uh, the only way you could ever do it, to overinvest in quarterback. But, um, oh, and hey, uh, Carson Wentz right now. I mean, obviously, he's playing poorly himself. But man, he is throwing to, like, me out there. And and this is the me that hates him. Like, that's what the receivers <laughs> are doing, it, right? Like, I'm intentionally alligator arming it because I don't want him to look good. That's exactly what, like whoever's not Greg Ward is doing right now. Man, so that Philly offense is just atrocious. I actually had a moment this weekend where I was going to, where I thought I had to disqualify somebody for not playing a kicker. Turns out they just didn't kick. They just went for two point <laughs> conversions. Like I had to look into it. Philly didn't kick once during that game. It was just that they, they, they hadn't, they, they just went for two points every time. I was like, how, what is, go- what the hell is happening over there? <laughs> like I thought I had to disqualify somebody in the fantasy league. Turns out I was wrong. And <laughs> so was did. Philadelphia. That That's the dream, right? Like, well, I guess Brandon McManus is the dream, which, hey, got him in all my leagues. Um <laughs> Never had to kick an extra point. That offense is so bad. Never, but 
it was good enough to get to the red zone. So he just kicked a bunch of 40 yarders. Yeah. Mm. And you're not going to get penalized for a missed 40 yarder like that. No, sir. Yeah. Uh, Doug asks, some young teams like the Jaguars have been criticized for getting rid of all of their veterans. Which Vikings veterans would be worth keeping for a true rebuild? Who can we let hey, go? Hey, people hate this team for doing this thing. Anyway, can the Vikings do that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I know we all like Harrison Smith, probably one of the be- you know, best safety in the league for a couple of years. Uh, it could, you know, we, we, we send him off to, you know, <laughs> to, to Buffalo for more picks. Yeah. <laughs> Someone, in, so in my piece that was like, where do the Vikings go from here? Which uh, I guess um, I didn't headline it, but I guess I picked six things the Vikings should do. Um, so six things the Vikings should do um, to better prepare for 2021, which I don't think is tanking. Um, in the comments of that piece, uh, someone was like, anything that is over 27 years old and not bolted to the floor should be traded. <laughs> which I'm just thinking like, you know, in some ways, Shamar Stefan is bolted to the floor. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, I mean, I get like, I get it. Um, so I don't talk a ton about like impact on the locker room. I don't talk a lot about the the leadership that players provide. I don't talk a lot about, you know, the coaching that players provide each other um, or, or chemistry all that much. That That is outside my wheelhouse. I do think that that's important. I think, you know, years ago when we started this podcast, I was pretty dismissive of it. I think as um, I've gotten a little bit more exposed to locker rooms, it's something I care a little bit more about. Um, it's important. It's just not something I can really speak authoritatively on. So I think, I think you do enter a problem when you do that. Like if you, uh, trade Harrison Smith, if you trade, uh, who else is over 27, there's not, not a ton of people anymore. I guess Eric Kendrick, God, that sucks. Um, so Eric Kendricks, Harrison Smith, um, Anthony Barr, um, which you can't trade right now cause he's on IR, but you know, at the end of the season, that's what you do. Um, I keep on thinking Yannick is a is a is a vet, but he's like twenty five. Um, Shamar Stefan, maybe Jula Johnson. I don't know if he's twenty seven, but I mean, trade him. Who cares? Um, I mean, trade trade him. Who cares? That's you're not going to get anything. So I guess it doesn't matter. Um, uh, you take like Amir Abdullah, uh, obviously Kyle Rudolph, um, Riley Reef, uh, and then Adam Thielen, right? So you've got two really good pieces, Adam Thielen and Harrison Smith. Um, you've got two uh, pretty good pieces, Eric Hendricks and Anthony Barr. And I say pretty good not because Eric Hendricks is not that great, but because he's a linebacker. Um, and an interesting piece in Riley Reef because he's been playing really well this year, although he is coming off of a really bad game. Um, okay, so that's who you trade. You're without Thielen, you're without Reef, you're without um, either linebacker, you're without safeties. You've probably ended up with, I'd say you get one first round pick between uh, Harrison Smith and Adam Thielen between the two of them, maybe. Um, but let's say, you know, you split the difference. You get one first round pick, you get one second round pick, you get a third round pick and a fourth round pick for all that. So you, ex- you end up with two first round picks for the Vikings, a second round pick, two third round picks, and two fourth round, p- three fourth round picks. Uh, there's like another pick the Vikings have somewhere in there too. But that's what you end up having. Do you think that you can find solutions here? and also deal with the loss of leadership that you have in the locker room. Because I think Harrison Smith has been really important to the development of some of these younger defensive backs. I think Eric Hendricks is like keeping together a house of cards at linebacker. Um, And I think Adam Thielen has been really important to the way that the receivers have developed. Um, Now, you do have leaders that are younger than 27. I think Daniil Hunter is a really good example of that, right? Um, I'm I'm told that Pat Elfline is an example of that, right? and, you know, this kind of hits on how good of a leader can you be and still play poorly, which was the Chad Greenway discussion we used to have a lot. Um, oh, and then obviously you trade Kirk Cousins, and maybe that's the second round pick. So you've got, you, you know, you got a number of players. So you end up spending a first, uh, you're both your first round picks on grabbing a quarterback. Let's say you don't get Trevor Lawrence. Let's say you get, you know, whoever the second best quarterback is. Maybe it's Zach Wilson. Maybe it's Trey Lance. Maybe it's Justin Fields, right? So now you've got a second round pick, two third round picks, I don't know, three fourth round picks or whatever, right? Um I don't think that you have improved the roster for 2022 or whenever these guys were supposed to develop because you're going to miss on some of these picks. Let's say you hit on Justin Fields or whatever, right? Um, Are you going to also hit on your second-round receiver? Are you going to also hit on your third-round linebacker? Are you going to also hit on your third-round safety? Probably not. Um, So I am really sympathetic to the idea of like trading a bunch of these guys but you end up in a leadership vacuum. 
you end up with probably like I don't know that these I mean they're all there's a reason that you want to trade them right they're all old that's the reason all the other teams don't really want to spend a ton for them right and so um yeah you, you position yourself to get Justin Fields maybe you're better right because or Zach Wilson or whoever right maybe you're better because you've upgraded that quarterback because you know Kirk Cousins is bad right or whatever but man who's he throwing to is it just Justin Jefferson is it Justin Jefferson and you know you pick a bust in the third round at receiver and now you're relying on like KJ Osborne or whatever like okay <laughs> um I'm sure you Chad could... BB would would exist in some way I'm sure Amir Abdullah finds find some way to like give a fake ID to give the wrong age Chad Beebe is 26, by the way. Oh, really? Well, wow. <laughs> right? That uh, that I didn't see coming. Yeah. So uh, by the time the draft rolls around, he might be old enough that you got to trade him by the, by these rules. <laughs> I'm sure there would be many trade partners for oh, someone. Oh, with, yeah, absolutely. Someone is, absolutely. as most, unfortunately most... targeted as Chad Beebe. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so you got Justin Fields. He's being protected by Ezra Cleveland, which we don't know how that's going to go. Um, and and uh, you probably traded Dakota Dozier. So uh, you got Ezra Cleveland. You've got your second round or third round guard, right? You've got Garrett Bradbury. You've got uh, Oli Udo at guard, something that they have not tried to do probably for a reason. And Brian O'Neill. Like, okay, you've got like two players that you might be confident in. One guy that's got upside in Ezra Cleveland and two holes again. He's thrown to just Justin Jefferson and apparently not Chad Beebe. Um, so Justin Jefferson and KJ Osborne in your second round bust, right? Uh, now you've got a great defensive line because, you know, you didn't have to trade any of them because nobody wants them um, or they're under 27. Um, that's great. But now you don't have any linebackers. You don't have anybody to protect those cornerbacks. I, I don't know. I think I think you're probably worse. Just because, I mean, these players are old. You want to get rid of them for a reason. Well, no one wants to take them at, you know. I feel like a lot of people think that Adam Thielen goes for a first-round pick easily. I don't think that's the case, right? I don't think Harrison Smith goes for a first-round pick easily. I think there are teams, maybe, that you can convince to trade a first-round pick. I don't know that that's certain. If you can get a first-round pick for both of them, I would do it, right? Because I think between the two of them, you end up with a valuable player. Between those two first-round picks, you probably end up with a good player, right? If uh, if you can trade Riley Reef for a third round pick, yeah, I would probably do it. That would be surprising to me. So that would be, but I think you have to get good values uh, on these guys before that that makes sense for you to set up really effectively for a 2022 run. And the other, I didn't talk about the other benefit here, which is that you've just freed up a ton of cap space that you could bring some people in. Um, is this an attractive free agency destination? I, for players that only care about money, there's a lot of those. So maybe you've got a lot of cap space now. But for players that care about winning, you're just like, hey, we got a rookie quarterback and one receiver. You want to join up? Probably not going to get those players um, that prioritize that. You're probably going to get a bunch of players that love the weather here. Look at the Texans. The Texans were the perfect example of this. They had a ton of cap space after removing half of their team. There were no free agents that wanted anything to do with it. Yeah, but that's like a B.O.B. thing. Like I assume your your general manager has charisma. That might have something to do with it. Okay, (laughs) fine. But even Jacksonville, well, okay, if we're going to look at Jacksonville, we've got basically the same problem. But, yeah, it's, it's not like you know teams were, were jumping on, on their bandwagons because you know, they had the space. They, they had the ability to play. It's not like when Albert Haynesworth went over to Washington and went, I don't care. <laughs> Change the defensive <laughs> scheme. It's not going to matter to me. I'm just going to stay down whenever I get pushed down. <laughs> right yeah um and, and and by the way i don't want to i don't want to say that players that 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 are uh, motivated by money to sign with the team are going to be any worse than other players I just think you've limited your talent pool by making your your team worse is, is really what i'm getting at so yeah you're gonna get i don't know is russell okung super motivated by money maybe i mean he like dropped his agent and 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 recouped the agent fee by doing that maybe you get a russell okung right he's good it doesn't matter what he's motivated by so um Maybe you get like one or two of those guys, but like you've limited your free agent pool. So yeah, I don't know. Plus, it feels like fewer free agents are going to be hitting the market. So I don't know. Yeah, a bit a uh, bit of an odd time. Uh, Swervin Shervin asks: Since this is now a draft focused podcast, when will or should the Vikings spend significant draft or free agent capital on a receiver to per- to replace Thielen? This is not an indictment on Thielen, on Thielen rather, just future casting here. Yeah, yeah, he's 30. No, I, I'm totally on board with thinking about this. Absolutely. I don't think it's a first-round pick. I don't think you're even asking about a first-round pick. But I think beyond that, 
yeah, I think you invest a second round pick, right? Like before that Dak Prescott's injury, the Cowboys were rolling offensively with those three receivers. Now, obviously the Cowboys had a bunch of issues, but I think that those were largely unanticipated. I think that they expected their linebacker group to play well because they've played well. I think they expected some of those edge rushers to play well because they've played well. Um, you know, the only thing that you could expect the Cowboys to get worse at was corner because they let Byron Jones walk in free agency, uh, and running back because, you know, once you pay a running back, they get bad. Um, which man, I thought maybe Christian McCaffrey, but no, he just got hurt. Like, you know, that's just, it's just Derrick Henry right now. Like, man, the, the history of paying running backs just keeps on marching on, huh? Um, but yeah, like that's, you could expect that, right? The offensive line gets worse. That's an age thing, but you we didn't expect that going into the season. So um, I think that the Cowboys made, they were right to invest in CD Lamb. If they had known about, you know, these problems, they maybe would have invested in an offensive lineman or, or a cornerback or something. But, um, you know, that offense is humming. You know, the, the, the Cardinals just traded for a wide receiver, um, despite the fact that they had decent, not great, but like decent wide receivers and like Christian Kirk and Andy Isabella is getting a little bit better. And then Larry Fitzgerald is still somehow playing, I guess. Um, and he's doing pretty well. Uh, so, you know, they, they kind of supercharge their offense. So for one or two years, you're going to have one too many receivers. Like that's not a bad problem to have. So I think that you should do, especially because that first year, that receiver may not break out like Justin Jefferson did, right? They might have to wait a second, like most receivers do. Right. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think once you even get into the second round, it's worth having that discussion. Now, you're probably not going to get like Rashad Bateman, but this is a pretty good receiver class, I'm told. Yeah, I don't know. But like, it seems like a lot of people are talking about this like it's a pretty good receiver class. So in the third round, you could get somebody that, you know, might contribute in a year or two or the second round. And I think that you should take that chance again the following year if you've got someone, if you don't know, right? Like if, if they follow a typical rookie receiver curve in the, and, and, you know, you drafted them in the third round, um, they follow a typical rookie receiver curve and they don't really play that much. You should just go again because now Adam Thielen's 32. You might as well try to have three good receivers or if that doesn't work out two good receivers. So yeah, I think right away. And I think you should do it in the third round or something, or if the Vikings somehow find a way to get a second round pick, think about that in the second round. So yeah, I, this future casting, I think, is totally appropriate. Now you have to balance it against, you know, do you get a quarterback? Do you get a guard? Um, you know, do you get a defensive tackle? These are all appropriate questions. So, you know, those are more immediate needs. Receiver is a bit of more of an important position, except at, at quarterback. I wouldn't hate it if the Vikings were like, you know what? We're just going to continue being bad at guard, but we've got another good receiver. I actually, I don't mind that. So um, I think that this this question is fair. I'm just envisioning the uh, the draft day graphic where it says what the Vikings needs are and it just says everything. <laughs> right. I I feel like ESPN or, or somebody they just because they haven't done it yet, right? They haven't trolled a team that hard yet. I swear I've seen a team that said everything. <laughs> I, I, I I hope so. I, that's I feel huge. like I feel like I've seen that before. I, I'd have to I'd have to double check this, but I I, I swear I've, I saw something like that before. The, the the running backs not being or the running backs being paid and all of a sudden getting hurt or falling off the invisible the uh, invisible hand of Adam Smith just going around and kneecapping people. <laughs> that's how that's how it works. Yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> this is economics, folks. You pay a running back, and the invisible hand of Adam Smith is right there for you. Always yeah, holding the bat. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, tire iron, possibly. Nolan asks, for Uncle Arif's dating corner, since my Vikings, <laughs> since, since I love the Vikings, is a product of Renaissance-style concepts, as he says, which painting from that era de uh, best depicts my fandom? Is it the Mona Lisa smiling wryly at my pain? Or else Michelangelo's sculpture of Mary weeping over the slain Christ? Uh... I want to I want to clarify something. Love is a Renaissance era invention between people. Love of the Vikings that's that's tribal. That goes deep. That goes way back. That's but to answer your question, have you heard of a guy named Hieronymus Bosch? No, I can't say that I have. Uh, Google him right now and see what pops up on Google Images. Okay, well, first you're going to need to send me the name through our chat so that I can do that because I'm not a I'm just not going to be able to just pick that out quickly. 
Okay, yeah, that's fair. It is a Dutch name. Yeah, as it turns <laughs> out. <laughs> I've been uh, doing I'm send it into the Zencaster chat. So sure. let's see. If... Why yeah. not? Yeah, I've had uh, a conversation at work where I'm having to do things in a language I don't understand and I have to clarify repeatedly. You know, I'd love to help more, but I don't understand the language. And so I really do need very specific instructions as to, you know, how this whole thing works. Oh, I know exactly who this is. Yes, I have. <laughs> yes, I have seen uh, I have seen paintings uh, by him before. Yes. Yeah. So uh, that's it. That's your guy. I don't know if it's like he's probably not Renaissance. He's probably post Renaissance. But... Yeah, probably. Yeah, it, it seems post. But I mean, Christ in Limbo is a pretty good example of, of Vikings fan <laughs> of, uh, of Vikings fandom for the record. Uh, he said, also, I'm seeing some chatter about that. Gladney is a defend, uh, that Gladney is a decent run defending corner. What's the value of that versus uh, coverage abilities? Not a ton. Um he does seem like a good run defending corner and man have the Vikings had a bunch of those. Uh, Trey Waynes was, he was the best one. He was the best, was the best corner in the league. Uh, he could stop the run immediately, but anything past three yards past the line of scrimmage. Good Christ. It was over his head. Yeah. So, uh, he, Waynes had a good year and a half of coverage. I guess two years if you count the the second half of 2016, I want to say. Um, but yeah, okay, so, or 2017. So, okay, two years of coverage from Trey Waynes off of, you know, a five-year contract. Pretty good run defender for three years. Didn't see the field for the other two. Uh, Xavier Rhodes was a pretty good run defender for a little bit. Obviously not up to the, the level of Waynes. Uh, but, you know, it's not like anyone was Antoine Winfield, right? Like, no one was that. And plus, Winfield was like, good in coverage too so if you got a a bad coverage corner who is good at run defense you have a bad corner yeah but it doesn't hurt as much because he tackled the guy yeah well i mean it it's one of those things where oh it's it's good that you have that ability it's not what we necessarily we want more than just that yeah I, i remember um i was uh I think it was just like a forum conversation about a bunch of receivers. This is way back. It was like, when was Terry Robisky in the league? Like 2011. Um, and I was like, you know, I, what I really like about uh, this receiver, I think it was Terry Robisky. I was like, I think he might be the best run blocking receiver in the league. And somebody else was like, Arif, he has like five catches. And we were like, you know, 10 games for the season. And I was like, nah, but I mean, it's like, it's kind of cool because, you know, a, a 20 yard run turns into an 80 yard run. That's a touchdown. That's not nothing. Right. And, and they're like, Arif, he's a bad receiver. And I was like, well, y- yeah, mostly, but he's valuable to have on a roster. And literally the very next day he got cut. <laughs> Is that like looking at like looking at the house or looking at the apartment and being like, it only has a tub, it doesn't have a shower? Be like, or it only has a, like, yeah, it only has a tub, it'll, it doesn't have a shower. You're just like, you're, you're going to want it to do more than just the one thing. <laughs> you're right. Uh, no, Terry Robisky is the coach. Brian Robisky is the receiver. Why, was, why did he get cut? Um, I think he was cut by the Browns. It was, it was 2011. Nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> Just, you know, <laughs> the wrong generation of Robiskys. Yeah. <laughs> Which, I mean, who can't, who can't sympathize with that? Uh, let's go to Guybrush Threepwood, who asks... Uh, and that name. wasn't just a stutter. That's that was the name. Does c- does Cousins hate a reef? Every time a reef says Cousins will not play this bad again, he plays worse. Is he doing this purely because he's maddeningly frustrating, or does he really hate a reef and his quote unquote opinions? That's a quote unquote opinions. That's a for for people who don't know. Guybrush Three Point is a character in the Monkey Island series. Um, uh, just a phenomenal adventure series. Um, does Cousins hate me? Uh, I, I would say that if he does, it's it's unconscious. Like he he enacts the will of his hate towards me without knowing about it, which is arguably more insidious. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's more like a Manchurian candidate sort of thing. Right. Um, I, I don't know that every time I say he can't possibly play this bad again, he plays worse. But man, is it? 
Is it more than the stats would indicate is likely? I'll say that. I would say it it defies probability. Along those same lines, Christopher Wiley asks, will the Bills always go against whatever Arif has on them? Yeah, okay. So the Bills are the real deal. I published that article. I was like, look, this Titans game is not that meaningful. Allen actually played pretty well. These drops, this is a good receiving core. The drops are going to take care of themselves. They don't historically have a huge issue with drops over the course of their careers. And, you know, then they get like, I'm not going to say demolished by Kansas City. It was actually a pretty close game for a while. But, you know, they lose to Kansas City. I did say in the article, it kind of doesn't matter because Kansas City is good. So if they get blown out, that doesn't mean they're not a good team. But it is, it, nevertheless, it is embarrassing. So, uh, oh, and Allen actually did play poorly in that game. Like that f- phenomenal timing, dude. Playing at an MVP level the first four weeks, you slip a little bit. I'm like, well, you can't ignore the first four weeks. And then he does this. So, uh, yeah, they both are always going to do that. Yeah, probably. Uh, it leaves you feeling like you went through a table there. Uh, Dusty <laughs> asks, have you ever owned a Velcro wallet? Uh I was not old enough to own a Velcro wallet. Uh, that was, we should ask my brother that. Uh, <laughs> I bet Arshad totally had a Velcro wallet at some oh, point. Yeah. Uh, uh, Rebel. Yeah. The, 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 the best part about this question is not the fact that Dusty asked it. It's that uh, we had a comment on it asking uh, or saying, hopefully uh, from Ryan uh, saying, hopefully it had a chain on it. So no, someone didn't uh, steal such a cool invention. And my problem, <laughs> my problem is that I'm confident not only did I have a Velcro wallet at some point in high school, I can envision it. I think I even remember where I bought it, but, uh, it was like, and I remember it was, it was hemp. And I remember for some reason thinking to myself that that was cool. That made it cool that it was hemp. So cool, man. That's so cool. And <laughs> The problem is at some point during high school, I had a chain wallet too because it was the 90s. So I'm trying to think if the two coincided or not. And I don't know if they did. They had to have. God, I don't like being old. I don't like, <laughs> I'm not enjoying this 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 line of questioning at all. Thanks, Dusty. I'm in hell. Uh <laughs> Uh, next question is uh, oh yes let's, let's well, wrap at it least up. your Jinko jeans will match the uh, never match the- I never <laughs> owned <laughs> for the record I never Ooh. owned a pair of Jenkos I never owned a pair of Tommy Hilfiger's and I I did however own oh what was it I did own some uh, some Velcro or not Velcro. Uh, the it's not velour or something. What was it? Uh, or what? No, it wasn't velour. Like the the pants, the corduroy. I did own a bunch of corduroy pants. You know why I owned a bunch of corduroy pants? Because there was this guy in high school that wore them that I thought it was cool, and I was trying to emulate what he was doing. I'll give you one idea, one guess as to who that was that was rocking those, and I went, yeah, I should, I should, I should try that. I should Wait, probably do I follow. Know him? I should probably follow him onto a podcast too. I was going to guess it was Dusty. Okay. <laughs> okay. I just didn't go to the next level when that he did, which was like cloud shirts and all that. Like I never went that far, but no, I, um, <laughs> all sorts of like rave wear and stuff. No, I, I went corduroy. I went the gigantic, uh, you know, utility pockets on the side, whatever, but I never, I never went Genco and I never went to uh, Tommy Hilfiger. I didn't have the. This is one of those like I didn't have the money to be that preppy or something. But I just, I it just never happened. I remember my <laughs> older brother did, and he and I were not the same shape, so it wouldn't have worked. I ended up being much taller than him, so and much bigger and other like you know, stomach wise too. So it ended up working. Stomach wise. Stomach wise. Yes, I ended up being fatter than him. Is, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, Don from Ohio. I, I faced him in every dimension. Is I think what I would have gone with. Yeah. <laughs> At least I turned out to be a better person. Uh, Don from Ohio asks, is George Patton the logical choice for our next GM? Also, yes. will Arif add Danucci to his fantasy football leagues and start him? Uh, for those who are not aware, this is uh, Mr. Danucci from Arif's Dukes. My Dukes, yeah. he uh, He's a transfer from Pitt, led uh, the Dukes to uh, several national championship appearances, 
a uh, good enough quarterback to be noticed by the NFL, um, but not a part of the uh, North Dakota State Industrial Complex. Um, so didn't get kind of, you know, subsidized into the NFL like maybe some other quarterbacks have been and will be. But uh, uh, did show enough talent to be added to the Cowboys practice squad. And uh, then the active roster uh, and, um, you know, Andy Dalton keeps this up. You'll start a game or something, which uh, would be hilarious and, and dope. Uh, so Ben <laughs> Nucci, uh, my Dukes, uh, lifelong fan of this guy that I definitely followed. Um, so. Uh, I mean, if he starts, yeah, I'll add him. But I'm I'm not gonna like jump the gun on this. I still gotta win. You're not gonna be like me when I chose uh, Jordan Love as my last pick overall in one of the drafts. <laughs> <laughs> well, you picked you picked. Uh, was that the same one where you picked Justin Tucker first overall? Uh, I don't know. I just know that I uh, this week on waivers I finally dropped Jordan Love, or I tried to. I don't know if it's gone through yet, but I did just try <laughs> to drop Jordan Love. I think I've given up on the whole Jordan Love experience. That I mean, it would have been hilarious if that had worked out. I mean, I picked up Jalen Hurts in a bunch of leagues, and I definitely have no reason to drop him yet. I picked up Madison because I knew that that Cook was at some point going to have something dumb happen, but I didn't know that it would be this early. So I'm just like, okay, well, <laughs> let's let's just plug this in. Sure, why not? All right, that is going to be it for this episode of Norse Code. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, Arif, what do you have to plug? Um, yes, the Players of the Week column is coming out soon. I'm going to have a piece on whether or not the Bears are real. Um, hopefully I don't bet 0 for 2 on that. Um, and then I'm going to be doing a, uh, as the Vikings said to the bye, I'm going to be doing a, a players of the season so far for the midseason. Could accumulate all the knowledge that I have theoretically gained by writing about the entire NFL every week. That should be um, all the theoretical knowledge, you say? Yeah, I don't know if I remember any of it, which would make the knowledge purely theoretical and not actual. Oh, I, I suppose you do have a point. I suppose you are technically correct, which, as we have discussed on the show, is in fact the best kind of correct. All right. Well, that is going to be it for this episode. Uh, those who are subscribed to Patreon will have a bonus episode waiting for you on Thursday. Everyone else, you're going to have to wait until next week when we come back, as it is a bye week. So we will see you next week. So for Arif, my name is James. Thank you guys so much for listening. And please remember to always bring your wine towel. And we will be back for the non-Patreon listeners next week. Norse Code is the largest and only division of Norse Code LLC. You can find Norse Code on the Daily Norseman, SB Nation's official Vikings blog, at dailynorseman.com. You can also find it on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Stitcher, or wherever fine podcasts are aggregated. Our Vikings blogger extraordinaire and generally useful human is Arif Hassan, and he can be found on Twitter at Arif Hassan NFL. You can also find his written work at theathletic.com. I am your podcast host and producer, and my name is James Pagoshnik. You can find me at the show's official Twitter feed at NorseCodeDN or my personal account at Big Mono. If you'd like to donate a few bucks to the show, you can make your one-time donation at paypal.me slash NorseCode. Or you can make a recurring monthly contribution by visiting patreon.com slash NorseCode. A donation of $3.50 per month does get you bonus material from the show and much more. Any questions or comments that won't fit in a tweet can be sent to norsecodepodcast at gmail.com. On behalf of the Norse Code staff, we thank you so much for listening. Our formula is this. We go out, we hit people in the mouth. <laughs>